What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Atlantic Files, the number one podcast on the number one division in the NBA, brought to you by BasketballSocietyOnline.com and the Underdog Sports Podcast Network. As always, joined by your host, myself, Alex Fishbein. So, I just want to say right now, guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe below. Make sure you're subscribed because we have tons of videos coming out all the time. Interviews, talks about, you know, how the NBA landscape has changed. We have all of, uh, all of the Atlantic Files podcasts on here and everything. So make sure you join the Basketball Society by subscribing on our YouTube and Everywhere you get podcasts, you will find Basketball Society and The Atlantic Files. You can search either one of them. You will find both. And make sure you subscribe on there. You drop us a rating and a comment. I would love to see what you guys think about the show, about the podcast, and everything. So make sure you do that as well. I appreciate all of you who have been watching and supporting so far. And thank you for those who continue to do so. So without further ado... Our guest this week is Xavier Silas. He is the current assistant coach of the Delaware Blue Coats. That is the Sixers G League affiliate team. And Xavier has had an extensive playing career um, professionally from 2011 all the way up to 2019. He played overseas. He played in the G League. He had a couple uh, appearances in the NBA. And he also played with the Big Three. And he even played in the TBT, that's the basketball tournament for those that might watch that over the summer as well. Um, he has started a prep program called Colorado Prep over in Colorado. Uh, he, in, for college, he played actually at the University of Colorado and Northern Illinois. And right now, he's coaching some AAU. He's helping run that Colorado Prep program and, of course, being the assistant coach at the Delaware Bluecoats. So... Let's jump into that conversation with Xavier Silas. Thank you guys for watching another episode. Make sure you drop that subscribe, the like, and also make sure you give us a rating and everything on the podcast. Thank you guys. Hope you enjoy the conversation. What's going on, everybody? Today we have Xavier Silas, former NBA player, former G League player, former Big Three player, played at the University of Colorado and Northern Illinois, current assistant coach of the Delaware Blue Coats, the Sixers G League affiliate. What's going on today? How you doing, man? You all good? I'm um, great. I'm just trying to get out of this snow. I know you guys are down in Florida escaping all the snow in Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Escaping the flow, the snow in in Delaware. Escaping it in Texas. It sounds like all kinds. That's all those snows everywhere. Colorado everywhere. Yeah, I know. It see, it seems like everywhere except southeast. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. But uh, so um, what I wanted to get into really is more so about your uh coaching career so far. Your coaching career getting kicked off here. So, um. I know there's you have a few things going on, not just the blue coats, but I was also looking into a lot of what uh, you started for Colorado Prep. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking into actually, I I was at the Big Three championship when your uh, team Power won the championship there. I was there taking pictures of you guys yeah. for that championship as well. Um, so I was reading some of your quotes from that too. So was I, what I really want to ask is where did your like love for coaching, your passion for coaching, like where did that start? Was it when you were playing or, or later than that? Yeah. It kind of has like a few different origin stories a little bit. You know, I think the probably the very first kind of coaching bug was starting my AAU program. Probably I had a club team and we had like, we ended up having like 30 teams out in Colorado under under my program and coaching some of those teams kind of really started it for me and then kind of playing for USA basketball with, with coach Van Gundy, uh, Jeff, and and having conversations with him and him telling me, hey, look, you know, I think you'd be a good coach for one and two, I, I I think that you need to start coaching. And so like as many ways and different possibilities as you can do. Um, do it. And, and so I did that. And then, you know, a big one talking to friend for Shilla and really kind of picking his brain on it. Um, 
and then probably the the one that started it the most was was Nancy and and her putting me in that situation where I was able to coach those guys and call plays and you know have a big role in practice and in the huddles in the games and and that kind of turned the corner for me I'm like okay yeah this is def- definitely something that I want to do for sure I got you I mean that's huge uh it like advice and information getting it from coach Jeff Van Gundy and Fran Fraschilla those are two huge names right there and it was I mean it was great seeing you guys in the big three with the the dynamic you had with you and Nancy and then the rest of the team as well Um, it was pretty inspiring to watch just between I mean Nancy leading you guys to the championship and then you having that experience with her as well so going back to the AAU you said so is that when you started your AAU program and everything, is that what led you to then start the uh, Colorado prep for the Colorado high school players out there? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of turned into that, you know, pr- with, with, with club basketball, if you know anything about it, there's only mm-hmm. about two or three important weekends of the entire year that you can re- really, you know, get recruited. And so um, what I, I started thinking, hey, you know, like these guys need more, you know, like Colorado, especially those players, they need more. No one's coming to Colorado to watch Colorado high school basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, the main thing was they need to travel and, need, and they need to travel and play a, a real schedule during high school. And then, you know, I started you know, solution based kind of thinking, all right, well, how do I do that? Okay, well, they're prep school. You got to do prep school. Okay, well, where, what's the best prep um, league? The grind session, you know, and so getting us into the grind session and and, and being able to do that and then going into the administrative stuff, you know, like how are we going to travel? How are we going to pay for things? Fundraising, you know, finding donors, scholarships, um, tuition, and, you know, we, we just kind of built it from the ground up. Um, but it's it's second to none experience, you know, like I, I talked to Tad Boyle and he said a lot of being a head coach in college is not is not coaching. <laughs> it's the logistics. It's making sure that the academics are right. It's, you know, uh, fundraising. It's it's talking to donors and alums and, and really navigating all of that. And so getting that type of experience is huge for me. Um mm-hmm because you know there's a lot that goes into not only founding but running uh, a prep school i got you so it's a it sounds like a lot of these things you're starting with are kind of like uh the building blocks to at least where you eventually want to go like starting with the aau program to get into coaching and everything now colorado prep to get all the background side of everything Mm -hmm. um so what how then did that lead you to becoming the assistant coach then at the blue coats? Well, that's the experience side, right? You know, like you got to get the experience with the logistic and the admin side, but the experience and actually coaching um, is, is important, just as important. Right. And so I, I did Stacy Lovelace with the NBA reached out to me while I was still playing and said, I, I have a, she knows that I was kind of into coaching and I had my club program and all that stuff. And she said, there's a coaches program for uh, ex NBA guys and girls, uh, WNBA girls um, that, you know, they, it kind of teaches you how to be a coach. Um, it's like an intensive. And she said, I think that it, you would be really good at this. So it taught you how to use sports code, fast scout, fast draw, draw on the board, coaches board. I mean, it was, it was, it was ran by Butch Carter, who was, you know, Vince Carter's um, head coach in Toronto uh, and, and uh, Tracy McGrady's, you know, they were on that team together. Um, mm-hmm. And Nisha Curry, who is the, the first woman to be an assistant coach on the boys side in college and Garrett Kelly. And so like, it was really, really good to sit there and have an intensive with them for an entire summer. And it was hard. I mean, it, it was, it was really hard work. And I learned a whole lot from it. They put us in situations. They, they, they had us coaching at the NBA draft combine. So, you know, this was the year taco fall was coming out. And so taco was on my team and that's how I was able to get that relationship with him. Uh, we, I was a head coach at Portsmouth, which for those who don't know is like the top college seniors, uh, go and play in a tournament 
in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, and, and I was able to, to be a head coach and I had some success going to the championship there. And so like that experience, being able to get that kind of coaching stuff is, is, is how, uh, I was able to, to kind of make a name for myself, um, during that deal, because like at the at Portsmouth, at the combine, um, every NBA team was there. So they all saw me coaching. They all saw, and they were like, Oh yeah, you're doing coaching now. Okay. And then, uh, uh, Elton Brand kind of reached out, um, and that's how the Sixers thing happened. So um, it, it was good, and it's a great experience. You know, last year was kind of like getting my feet wet, and this year they're putting me in charge of the offense. And so it's it's just good responsibility, and I have to kind of figure it out and, and do what I do. I got you. And I, I want to touch on um, the offense this year in a second, because I saw the, the Delaware is having one of the best seasons so far that they've ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back a little, that first year you had with Delaware, mm-hmm. like what what exactly did you learn there in that first year that you might not have known before or that you could use moving forward after that? It was awesome. You know, I think Connor Johnson, our head coach, does a great job of uh, putting us in situations and, and, and forcing us to learn and for, forcing us to have responsibility. Like the first year he did, uh, he did, he cut up the seasons in thirds. So like one third, I was in charge of the offense. The other third, I was in charge of player development. And the other third, I was in charge of the defense. And so like, I really got to see everything and what it's like to do everything in the first year. Um, and so, you know, and it's, it's just like experience that you can't, you can't uh, substitute it, you know, like it's nothing that you can read in a book or anything like you just really have to do it. And so um, that was, that was huge for me. And it was able to help me kind of know what he wanted and and what works and what doesn't work on all sides of the ball. So, I mean, that's stuff that I'll, I'll, I'll take for the rest of my coaching career just because I was thrown into it and was able to kind of like sink or swim. Okay. And it, so is it um, like, how different is it on the G league aspect of coaching? Because isn't there like some sort of a balance of with that player development, you're also trying to groom guys to move up that might be on two way contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, because I know last season uh, when uh, I was at a few of the games, you had guys like shake Milton coming down to play a few games. You had guys like uh, Mariel Shayok down there as well. That still had chances to move up. Is there some sort of like in between that there is with these guys that you have to like kind of coach them different than the guys that are there at on a G league contract? Uh, not necessarily. I think that, you know, the whole thing is like development. And before you remember, it was called the development league. And so like right. everyone's there to develop. Right. And so like, um, the, the guys that are on two ways and assignment players, you know, like shake shake was with us a lot last year. Mar was with us. Um, Norvell Pell was with us. Uh, he, he you know, we, he had just signed a contract with the Brooklyn Nets a few weeks ago, you mm-hmm. know, like it's, it's, you have to do the same with everybody, right? Like you have to, you have to pour into everyone. And so like, that was part of when I was over player development. Um, What does everyone need to work on? How do we do it? When do we do it for how long? Like all of that stuff. And, and it it goes into it, you know, those guys, it really comes down to the opportunity. And, and if you're an assignment guy, you're on an NBA team and they assign you down or you're a two way you're going to have more opportunity on the court when we're playing. Right. And so Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, I would say the, the, the way that they are treated quote unquote differently is that they're going to play those minutes, you know, like the whole point that they're there is to play minutes. And so I would say that is different more so than how we approach them as coaches in their development, if that makes sense. Okay. I see what you're saying. So um, going from last season into this season, was there any kind of different mindset going forward? Because I know like the the season itself is obviously different with COVID happening and kind of shortening the teams and now the new G League Ignite team as well. Um, Was there like 
any kind of big differences for Delaware itself moving into this season? Or is it kind of like we're still doing what we, you know, the player development like we want to do and everything, and it's just kind of the only difference is the location, the amount of teams and things like that? Yeah, I think that we kind of kept our same theme. You know, last year was defend, share, and run, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, um, we're we're doing that at a high rate. You know, defense is really big for us, um, and 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 we're doing a good job with that. And then sharing, we're number one team in assists. Um, last year we were we were top ten in pace or top five in pace, and this year we're top five or ten in pace as well. So we we definitely run, and so we kind of came into it. Um, Piggyback, piggybacking off of last year, right? Uh, we had made the playoffs last year. It was the first time in Blue Coats history or Delaware history that they had made a playoffs. And we kind of picked up where we left off on the same themes. You know, we got to defend, we got to run, we have to share the ball and and we're doing that. And it's kind of working out in, 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 the, in the beginning and like the first third of this season. Right. So that's, and that's what I was alluding to earlier. It said, uh, let's see. I saw the tweet from Steve Kyler uh, mentioning you that Delaware is now top 10 in pace while being number one in free throw attempt rate, number two in turnover percentage and number one in assist percentage. So I yeah. see, I mean, that right there is a testament to your guys' defense, the fast break, the pace getting higher. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what I've noticed a little bit, the difference in this season compared to last season from what I've seen so far is there seems to be um, kind of like a bigger focus on really just um, pass and move, pass and move, pass and move. Cause a lot of what I saw last year was, you know, guys, it was either fast break or slower half court um, mm -hmm. packages and everything. But this time, even the half court seems fast. Yeah. Um, a big emphasis on half court pace. Right. And, and, you know, like I think people get caught up in just full court pace, which mm -hmm. makes sense, right. Fast breaks and all that, but you still have to have pace in the half court. And that's kind of like a little, a little piece that we really focus on a lot because that's really hard to guard. It's creating an advantage and keeping an advantage. Right. And the only way you can do that is with pace. And so that's our culture. We we're always saying culture. We probably say culture more than any other word, but <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's the truth. Like you have to keep that culture. It has to be like a thing that we do. And um, the ball can't stop. You know, you have to have a certain mentality trying to touch that paint and, and move and, and so we're doing that. And, you know, the, the next thing is staying disciplined and right. consistent in doing it, you know, and we know it works, but it, it's, it's hard, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to be successful and stay successful. So um, that's kind of where we're at now is trying to keep that, um, keep that tension for, for our guys. Right. And so as of right now, you guys and the G league ignite team are the only two undefeated teams. Mm -hmm. And um I didn't see the schedule recently. I don't know when you play those guys, but um, is there like, what is the game plan against those young guys? <laughs> oh man, we're so far away from game planning for them. Um, I, I do know, I mean, I've, I've seen them play cause I had to go scout uh, them and I, I'm going to scout them today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, those guys, Bobby Brown and Jared Jack are, are, are the heartbeat of that team. Oh yeah. So, um, you know, and I played with Bobby Brown, call him six, this, this summer in the TBT. And so, you know, I know what he's capable of. Jared Jack's killing right now. Um, you know, Jalen Green and, 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 and JK and all those guys, are they're, they're all good. I mean, that whole team is stacked, right? And so game planning for them is kind of like maybe I, I would say a tough thing to do. I, I would say we have to do what we do. Right. right. You know, we have to focus on us. And if we do what we do, we have a really good chance. Um, and that's playing with pace on on both ends, being aggressive, physical and aggressive on both ends. And and we've been able to do that. I think that if we get outside of our game plan and what we do, that's when we start having problems. I got you. So um, one big thing for this whole year, uh, we saw it with the NBA, with the experiences in the bubble and everything. Now you guys are in the bubble down there in Florida. What has been 
like has it been just drastically different just being there in the bubble has it been you know bad experience good experience um how's it been so far for everybody you know you test every single day um the food is the food is solid you know what i mean it was tough when we all had to quarantine and stay in our rooms um right. when we first got here but once we started to move around and once the basketball started it's kind of been flying by um so i would say I mean, it's probably as good as a bubble can get, right? You know, you're going to miss your family and all of that. But outside of that, I, I would say it's, it's pretty good. And it's going by fast because we play so much. I mean, we play every other day at least and a lot of times back to back. So mm -hmm. it's flying and, and we're busy and and we're having fun and we're winning. So that makes it a little bit easier too. Oh, you yeah. Know, that's the losing teams. I'll probably have a different answer. <laughs> no, that's for sure. <laughs> and I saw, I saw your video for, uh, for Delaware too. And I don't know about you, but I've never, I've never been around alligators in person, but I wasn't trying to see one. <laughs> I was so amazed that they even just let alligators be in this lake, like right on Disney world. <laughs> Disney world. I just don't, I don't get it, but. They're there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, getting back to kind of your, your coaching journey and everything. Um, so right now, you know, leading the offense for the blue coats as the assistant coach, it, what it, is there already a plan of where to go next, where to move forward to, or kind of just keep going head down where you are right now and then see where that takes you. I think it's a little bit of both. It has to be right. You got to stay in the moment, have to put the head down and work. And, 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 and that's what I'm doing right now, especially in the bubble. Of course, um, mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about my next steps or anything. Of course, if you, if you know me, you know, I want to be a head coach. Um, and, and, and that's the goal. Um, but I, I'm well aware that, that putting my head down, staying in the moment and making everything up right now is, is the best way to get there. So, I haven't really thought about it. Um, uh, my, my agent is, I kind of leave that up to him and, and, and that's that, you know. Gotcha. For sure. For sure. Um, so after that, there's kind of two more questions that I want to ask that are kind of things we ask from basketball society a lot. So first one, just relating to coaching, if there were two people that you could just have a dinner with and pick their brain about coaching anyone like dead, alive, past, present, uh, who would that be? Oof, that's a really tough one. Um, when it comes to coaching, um, I, I would probably say Don Meyer. I, okay. I'd want to have a conversation with him. I just know a lot of people from the Don Meyer tree and I respect them so much, but I never really was able to sit down and really talk to him. So I think that, that I, I, I definitely have a conversation with him, especially now that I want to, I wanted to as a player, but now that I'm a coach, I definitely want to. Um, and, and I, I would actually want to talk to Kobe. And, okay. and the reason I would want to is because he was making that transition too into like turning that. And I, and I would really want to see how he was kind of taking that mama mentality and turning it into the coaching side and what he was planning to do with that and how he was approaching it. Because, you know, everyone's probably seen that tweet in the basketball world. Like they had gotten beat by a team, you know, by like 50 a year prior and then they beat them by like mm -hmm. 50 the next year right and and i you know i wonder kind of like what how he approached it because he was such a great competitor and basketball player um i wanted to see how that was going to translate into coaching so those would be my two for sure okay i mean that's a great two and it is i it is an interesting um thought on how he did change that because a lot of times like if you get a coach who's you know, too intense or something, some guys just shut off. So that, that would be really interesting to figure that out. Yeah. Um, right. And I actually have uh, one little quick question before the last question, but uh, I, I it just as a, it's just been funny going around about everything with uh, B-Ball Paul, how everyone doesn't even call him by his like full name. It's just B-Ball Paul now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I'm sure everyone from around me wants to know, like, wh what have you seen out of B-Ball Paul and how, how do you think he's going to uh, keep growing with you guys and moving forward and 
potentially getting back up there with the Sixers. And I haven't seen anybody work hard as hard as B-Ball Paul in a while. Um, the work he puts in before practice, after practice, um, and I've been around professionals. I mean, I've been around this thing for a long time. And the work that he continues to put in, even on back-to-backs, even on like just the energy that he has in his approach is I haven't seen it in a while. Um, and that's what sticks out the most to me. He's a, he's, he's a fierce competitor. He wants to get better. He wants to be better at the things that he's not as good at. You know, it's not mm-hmm. just, you know, I think it's a certain comfort level for people to work on things that are already good at. You know, a lot of people want to do that. You know, you're good at something. Let's go work on that. It's really uncomfortable to kind of continue to keep pushing yourself to work on things you're not good at. And so with his ball handling, with his shooting and just like literally running sprints by himself, <laughs> timing it by himself, you know, like he is an ultimate um, gym rat. And so that's what has impressed me the most. And so what was not a surprise at all was that he was the player of the week because I will guarantee you I'll put my house on it. No one wor- has worked as hard as he has in the time that we've had in the bubble. And so I think that he's going to continue to do that. Um, Of course, he has a bunch to get better at, but that thing is a real um, positive when it comes to B-Ball Paul. Oh, yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, you can't, you can teach a lot of things, but work ethic isn't one of them. (laughs) No, no, and he has it. I mean, he's, he has it. I love it. No, nah, that's great. So the last question, which is our mainstay question for Basketball Society, is why do you think society needs basketball? Oh, I mean, I think that for a lot of reasons, and probably easier for me to, to answer it now with the pandemic and everything, but we just think about how much we needed it when that when it first happened and everything was shut down. You know, mm-hmm. we don't realize how much of it is a stress reliever. We don't realize how much of it is entertainment. Um, we don't realize how much we need that competitiveness, you know, to cheer for something, to, to win or lose. Um, I mean, I, I just think that it's it's a certain entertainment that is so unpredictable, you know. Right that that it's, it's, it's unmatched it's fast paced you know it's a lot of scoring uh i talk to players about this all the time but like there's so many mistakes and and problem solving in it and and you know like that's that's what makes those good drama series really good right there's mm-hmm. there's problems and you have to fix it and oh what's going to happen and it you just you see that over and over again in basketball and that's why you know basketball fans really love it and um you know i i think that it'll, it'll, it'll be a long time before something um as big as the last dance and in the situation that we were in where everybody watched it every single you know every basketball person watched it every single week like clockwork made time for it. Like that doesn't happen anymore. And so just to experience that, like, you know, like you were thinking, Oh, what are we going to, it was like a party. Like, what are we going to (laughs) eat for it? What are we ordering? You know, like what's the setup. And so um, I just think that it's really important. I I think that we need it. You know, I think that that we need it for all those reasons that I just said, and probably a lot more that I didn't think of. No. Yeah. I mean, the last dance was even non-basketball people were tuning in because of, like you said, the drama around it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's, I think that like, we don't think about it like that, but what makes a good TV show on Netflix is the drama and, Mm -hmm. and how they go about solving it and, you know, all that. And that's what basketball is. And, and, and the, the problem solvers, are the ones that can score from so far and, you know, KD and what he can do and Giannis and, you know, LeBron, like all that, they're just problem solvers that we just continue to are amazed at because it's so, they keep doing it over and over again. And and so, you know, I think that that's why we need that. We, we, that's the best entertainment. It's the best entertainment. I completely agree. hundred percent. That's a great answer. (laughs) (laughs) 
But hey, Top I pre- five basketball society answer. You know, when, when y'all break it down in like 10 years, <laughs> make sure I'm on there, baby. Oh, it's it's gonna be up there. It's definitely gonna be it's definitely gonna be top five, maybe even top three. We, we, like, okay. we'll definitely see. Okay. <laughs> but I appreciate you joining me today. The next when you get that head coaching gig, we're gonna have to get you back on here to talk about the head coaching spot. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You know, it uh, hopefully it's sooner than later, but you never know. It's all about the journey, right? Agreed, definitely. Always yeah. got as being on the Delaware and the Philly side, you always got to trust the process, right? You got to trust the process <laughs> and the process is the most important thing. Got to have fun with it too. Exactly. And yeah. hopefully, hopefully I can see you guys on the sidelines at Delaware sometime soon. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully it gets back to normal, but thanks again. Appreciate you joining me. I uh, hope you guys hope you have a great day and uh, hope you guys keep, keep winning down there in Florida. Yeah, we have one tonight. We need this one. We need this one. So we'll do it. It's my scout too. So hopefully we get some we get some good energy going towards it. Oh, that means it's gonna be a good game plan. I already know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Thank you. All right. All right, Bye-bye. have a good one.